The Weirdest World by R. A. Laverty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. The Weirdest World by R. A. Laverty. Odd Planet. The bipeds talked from their heads and saw only what lay before them. In short, they were pathetic and deadly. 1. As I am now utterly without hope, lost to my mission and lost in the sight of my crew, I will record what petty thoughts I may have, for what benefit they may give some other starfarer. Nine long days of bickering. But the decision is sure. The crew will maroon me. I have lost all control over them. Who would have believed that I would show such weakness when crossing the barrier? By all the tests, I should have been the strongest. But the final test is the event itself. I failed. I only hope that it is a pleasant and habitable planet where they put me down. Later. They have decided I am no longer the captain, even in name. But they have compassion on me. They will do what they can for my comfort. I believe they have already selected my desert island, so to speak, an out-of-the-way globe, where they will leave me to die. I will hope for the best. I no longer have any voice in their councils. Later. I will be put down with only the basic survival kit, the ejection mortar and sphere for my last testament to be orbited into the galactic drift a small cosmoscope so that i will at least have my bearings one change of blood an abridged universal language correlator a compendium of the one thousand philosophic questions yet unresolved to exercise my mind a small vial of bug kill and a stack of sexy magazines later it has been selected, but my mind has grown so demoralized that I do not even recognize the system, though once this particular region was my specialty. The globe will be habitable. There will be breathable atmosphere, which will allow me to dispense with much bothersome equipment. Here the filter used is nitrogen. Yet it will not matter. I have breathed nitrogen before. There will be sufficient water much of it saline, but sufficient quantities of sweet. Food will be no problem. Before being marooned, I will receive injections that should last me for the rest of my probably short life. Gravity will be within the range of my constitution. What will be lacking? Nothing but the companionship of my own kind, which is everything. What a terrible thing it is to be marooned, one of my teachers used to say that the only unforgivable sin in the universe is ineptitude. That I should be the first to succumb to space ineptitude, and be an awkward burden on the rest of them? But it would be disastrous for them to try to travel any longer with a sick man, particularly as their nominal leader. I would be a shadow over them. I hold them no rancor. It will be today. Later. I am here. I have no real interest in defining where here is, though I have my cosmoscope and could easily determine it. I was anesthetized a few hours before, and put down here in my sleep. The blasted half-acre of their landing is near. No other trace of them is left. Yet it is a good choice, not greatly unlike home. It is the nearest resemblance I have seen on the entire voyage, which is to say that the pseudodendrons are enough like trees to remind me of trees, the herbage near enough to grass to satisfy one who has never known real grass. It is a green, somewhat waterlogged land of pleasant temperature. The only inhabitants I have encountered are a preoccupied race of humpback browsers who pay me scant notice. They are quadruped and myopic, and spend nearly their entire time at feeding. It may be that I am invisible to them, yet they hear my voice and shy away somewhat from it. 
I am able to communicate with them only poorly. Their only vocalization is a sort of vibrant, windy roar, but when I answer in kind, they appear more puzzled than communicative. They have this peculiarity. When they come to an obstacle of terrain or thicket, they either go laboriously around it, or force their way through it. It does not seem to occur to them to fly over it. They are as gravity-bound as a newborn baby. What air-traveling creatures I have met are of a considerably smaller size. They are more vocal than the myopic quadrupeds, and I have had some success with conversing with them, but my results still await a more leisurely semantic interpretation. Such communication of theirs as I have analyzed are quite commonplace. They have no real philosophy, and are singularly lacking in aspiration. They are almost total extroverts, and have no more than the rudiments of introspection. Yet they manage to tell me some amusing anecdotes. They are quite good-natured, though moronic. They say that neither they, nor the myopic quadrupeds, are the dominant race here, but rather a large, grub-like creature, lacking a complete outer covering. From what they are able to convey of this breed, it is a nightmarish kind of creature. One of the flyers even told me that the giant grubs travel upright on a bifurcated tail. But this is difficult to credit. Besides, I believe that humor is at least a minor component of the mentality of my airy friends. I will call them birds, though they are but a sorry caricature of birds at home. Later. I am being hunted. I am being hunted by the giant grubs. Doubling back, I have seen them on my trail examining it with great curiosity. The birds had given me a very inadequate idea of these. They are indeed unfinished. They do lack a complete outer covering. Despite their giant size, I am convinced that they are grubs, living under rocks and in masses of rotten wood. Nothing in nature gives the impression of so lacking an outer covering as the grub, that obese, unfinished worm. These are, however, simple bipeds. They are wrapped in a cocoon, which they seem never to have shed, as though their emergence from the larval state were incomplete. It is a loose, artificial sheath, covering the central portion of the corpus. They seem never to divest themselves of it, though it is definitely not a part of the body. When I have analyzed their minds, I will know the reason for their carrying it. Now I can only conjecture. It would seem a compulsion, some psychological bond that dooms them in their apparent adult state, to carry their cocoons with them. Later, I am captured by three of the giant grubs. I had barely time to swallow my communication seer. They pinned me down and beat me with sticks. I was taken by surprise, and was not momentarily able to solve their language, though it came to me after a short interval. It was discordant, and vocal, and entirely gravity-bound, by which I mean that its thoughts are chained to its words. There seems nothing in them above the vocal. In this, the giant grubs were less than the birds, even though they had a practical power and cogency that the birds lacked. What will we do with the blob? asked one. Why, said the second one, you hit it on that end and I'll hit it on this. We don't know which end is ahead. Let's try it for bait, said the third. Catfish might go for it. We could keep it alive till we're ready to use it. Then it would stay fresh. No, let's kill it. It doesn't look too fresh even the way it is. Gentlemen, you are making a mistake, I said. I have done nothing to merit death, and I am not without talent. Besides, you are not considering the possibility that I may be forced to kill you three instead. I will not die willingly. Also, I will thank you to stop pounding on me with those sticks. It hurts. I was surprised and shocked at the sound of my own voice. It nearly as harsh as that of the grubs. But this was my first attempt at their language, and musicality does not become it. Hey, fellas, do you hear that? Was that the blob talking? Or was it one of you playing a joke? Harry, Stanley, have you been practicing to be ventriloquists? Not me. Not me, either. It sure sounded like it was it. Hey, Blob, was that you? Can you talk, Blob? 
Certainly I can talk, I responded. I am not an infant, nor am I a blob. I am a creature superior to your own kind, if you are examples. Or it may be that you are only children. Perhaps you are still in the pupa stage. Tell me, is yours an early stage, or an arrested development, or are you indeed adult? Hey, fellas, we don't have to take that from any blob. I'll cave in its blasted head. That's his tail. It's his head. It's the end it talks with. Gentlemen, perhaps I can set you straight, I said. That is my tail you are thwacking with that stick, and I am warning you to stop it. Of course I was talking with my tail. I was only doing it in imitation of you. I am new at the language and its manner of speaking, yet it may be that I have made a grotesque mistake. Is that your heads that you are waving in the air? Well, then, I will talk with my head, if that is the custom. But I warn you again not to hit me on either end with those sticks. Hey, fellas, I bet we could sell that thing. I bet we could sell it to Billy Wilkins for his reptile farm. How would we get it there? Make it walk. Hey, Blob, can you walk? I can travel, certainly. But I would not stagger along precariously on a pair of flesh stilts with my head in the air as you do. When I travel, I do not travel upside down. Well, let's go then. We're going to sell you to Billy Wilkins for his reptile farm. If he can use a blob, he'll put you in one of the tanks with the big turtles and alligators. You think you'll like them? I am lonesome in this lost world, I replied sadly, and even the company of you peeled grubs is better than nothing. I am anxious to adopt a family and settle down here, for what years of life I may have left. It may be that I will find compatibility with the species you mentioned. I do not know what they are. Hey, fellas, this Blob ain't a bad guy at all. I'd shake your hand, Blob, if I knew where it was. Let's go to Billy Wilkins' place and sell him. 2. We traveled to Billy Wilkins' place. My friends were amazed when I took to the air, and believed that I had deserted them. They had no cause to distrust me. Without them, I would have had to rely on intuition to reach Billy Wilkins, and even then I would have lacked the proper instructions. Hey, Billy, said my loudest friend, whose name was Cecil, what will you give us for a blob? It flies and talks, and isn't a bad fellow at all. You'd get more tourists to come to your reptile show if you had a talking blob in it. He can sing songs and tell stories. I bet he could even play the guitar. Well, Cecil, I'll give you all of ten dollars for it, and try to figure out what it is later. I'm a little head on my hunches now, so I can afford to gamble on this one. I can always pickle it and exhibit it as a genuine hippopotamus kidney. Thank you, Billy. Take care of yourself, Blob. Goodbye for now, gentlemen, I said. I would like you to visit me some evening as soon as I become acclimated to my new surroundings. I will throw a wingding for you, as soon as I find out what a wingding is. My God, said Billy Wilkins, it talks. It really talks. We told you it could talk and fly, Billy. It talks, it talks, said Billy. Where is that blasted sign painter? Eustace, come here. We got to paint a new sign. The turtles in the tank I was put into did have a sound basic philosophy, which was absent in the walking grubs, but they were slow and lacking inner fire. They would not be obnoxious company, but neither would they give me excitement and warmth. I was really more interested in the walking grubs. Eustace was a black grub, while the others had been white, but like them he had no outside casing of his own, and like them he also staggered about on flesh stilts with his head in the air. It wasn't that I was naive or hadn't seen bipeds before, but I don't believe anyone ever became entirely accustomed to seeing a biped travel in this peculiar manner. Good afternoon, Eustace, I said pleasantly enough. The eyes of Eustace were large and white. He was a more handsome specimen than the other grubs. That you talking, bub? Say, you really can talk, can't you? I thought Mr. Billy was fooling. Now just you hold that expression a minute, and let me get it set in my mind. I can paint anything once I get it set in my mind. What's your name, Blob? Have Blob's names? Not in your manner. With us, the name and the soul, I believe you call it, are the same thing, and cannot be vocalized. So I will have to adopt a name of your sort. What would be a good name? Bub? 
I was always partial to George Albert Elroy Ellery. That's my grandfather's name. Should I also have a family name? Sure. What would you suggest? How about Macintosh? That will be fine. I will use it. I talked to the turtles while Eustace was painting my portrait on the tent canvas. Is the name of this world Florida? I asked one of them. The road signs say Florida. World, 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 water, 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 glub, 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 said one of them. Yes, but is this particular world we are on named Florida? World, world, water, water, glub, said another. Eustace, I can get nothing from these fellows, I called. Is this world named Florida? Mr. George Albert, you are right in the middle of Florida, the greatest state in the universe. Having traveled, Eustace, I have great reservations that it is the greatest, but it is my new home, and I must cultivate a loyalty to it. I went up in a tree to give advice to two young birds trying to construct a nest. This was obviously their first venture. You are going about it all wrong, I told them. First consider that this will be your home, and then consider how you can make your home most beautiful. This is the way they've always built them, said one of the birds. There must be an element of utility, yes, I told them, but the dominant motif should be beauty. The impression of expanding vistas can be given by long, low walls and parapets. This is the way they've always built them, said the other bird. Remember to empower new developments, I said. Just say to yourself, this is the newest nest in the world. Always say that about any task you attempt. It inspires you. This is the way they've always built them, said the birds. Go build your own nest. Mr. George Albert, Eustace said, Mr. Billy won't like you flying around those trees. You're supposed to stay in your tank. I was only getting a little air and talking to the birds, I said. You can talk to the birds, asked Eustace. Cannot anyone? I can a little, Eustace said. I didn't know anyone else could. But when Billy Wilkins returned and heard the report that I had been flying about, I was put in the snake house in a cage that was tightly meshed top and sides. My cellmate was a surly python named Pete. See you stay on your side, said Pete. You're too big for me to swallow, but I might try. There is something bothering you, Pete, I said. You have a bad disposition. That can come only from bad digestion or a bad conscience. I have both, said Pete. First is because I bolt my food. The second is because, well, I forgot the reason, but it's my conscience. Think hard, Pete. Why have you a bad conscience? Snakes always have a bad conscience. We have forgotten the crime, but we remember the guilt. Perhaps you should seek advice from someone, Pete. I kind of think it was someone's smooth advice that started us on all this. He talked the legs right off of us. Billy Wilkins came to the cage with another man, as the talking grubs called themselves. That it? said the other man. And you say it can talk? Of course I can talk, I answered for Billy Wilkins. I have never known a creature that couldn't talk in some manner. My name is George Albert Leroy Ellery Mackintosh. I don't believe I've heard yours, sir. Bracken, Blackjack Bracken. I was telling Billy here that if he really had a blob that can talk, I might be able to use it in my nightclub. We could have you here at the Snake Ranch in the daytime for the tourists and kids. Then I could have you in the nightclub at night. We could work out an act. Do you think you could learn to play a guitar? Probably, but it would be much easier for me to merely duplicate the sound. But then how would you sing and make the guitar noise at the same time? You surely don't think I'm limited to one voice box. Oh, I didn't know. What's that big metal ball you have there? That's my communication sphere, to record my thoughts. I would not be without it. When in danger, I swallow it. When in extreme danger, I will have to escape to a spot where I have concealed my ejection mortar and send my sphere into the galactic drift on a chance that it will be found. That's no kind of gag to put in the act. What I had in mind was something like this. Black Jack Bratton told a joke. It was a childish one, in poor taste. I don't believe that is quite my style, I said. All right, what would you suggest? 
I thought I might lecture your patrons on the higher ethic. Look, George Albert, my patrons don't have even the lower ethic. And just what sort of compensation are we talking about, I asked. Billy and I had settled on a hundred and fifty a week. A hundred and fifty for whom? Why, for Billy. Let's make it a hundred and fifty for myself and ten percent for Billy as my agent. Say, this blob's real smart, isn't he, Billy? Too smart. Yes, sir, George Albert, you're one smart blob. What kind of contract have you signed with Billy here? No contract. Just a gentleman's agreement? No agreement. Billy, you can't hold him in a cage without a contract. That's slavery. It's against the law. But, Blackjack, the blob isn't people. Try and prove that in court. Will you sign a contract with me, George Albert? I will not dump Billy. He befriended me and gave me a home with the turtles and snakes. I will sign a joint contract with the two of you. We will discuss terms tomorrow, after I have estimated the attendance, both here and at the nightclub. 3. Of the walking grubs who call themselves people, there are two kinds, and they place great emphasis on this difference. From this stems a large part of their difficulties. This distinction, which is one of polarity, cuts quite across the years and ability and station of life. It is not confined only to the people grubs, but also involves apparently all the beings on the planet Florida. It appears that a person is committed to one or the other polarity at the beginning of life, maintaining that polarity until death. The interlocking attraction-repulsion complex set up by these two opposite types has deep emotional involvements. It is the cause of considerable concern and disturbance, as well as desire and inspiration. There is a sort of poetic penumbra about the whole thing that tends to disguise its basic simplicity, expressible as a simultaneous polarity equation. Complete segregation of the two types seems impossible. If it has ever been tried, it has now evidently been abandoned as impractical. There is indeed an intangible difference between the two types, so that before the first day at the reptile wrench was finished, I was able to differentiate between the two more than 90% of the time. The knowledge of this difference in polarity seems to be intuitive. These two I will call beta and gamma, or boy and girl types. I began to see that this opposability of the two types is one of the great driving forces of the people. In the evening I was transported to the nightclub, and I was a success. I would not entertain them with blue jokes or blue lyrics, but the patrons seemed fascinated by my simple imitations of all the instruments of the orchestra and my singing of comic ballads that Eustace had taught me in the odd moments of that day. They were also interested in the way that I drank gin that is, emptying the bottle without breaking the seal. It seems that the grub people are unable to absorb a liquid without making direct contact with it. And I met Margaret, one of the girl singers. I was wondering to what type of people I might show affinity. Now I knew. I was definitely a beta type, for I was attracted to Margaret, who is unmistakably a gamma. I began to understand the queer effect that these types have on each other. She came over to my cage. I want to rub your head for good luck before I go on, she said. Thank you, Margaret, I replied, but that is not my head. She sang with incomparable sadness, with all the sorrow and sordidness that appears to be the lot of unfortunate gammas. It was the essence of melancholy made into music. It was a little bit like the ghost music on the asteroid Artemis, a little like the death chants on Dolmina. Sex and sorrow, nostalgia, regret. Her singing shook me with a yearning that had no precedent. She came back to my cage. You were wonderful, Margaret, I said. I'm always wonderful when I'm singing for my supper. I am less wonderful in the rare times when I am well fed. But are you happy, little buddy? I had become almost so until I heard you sing. Now I am overcome with sorrow and longing. Margaret, I am fascinated with you. I'll go for you too, Blob. You're my buddy. 
Isn't it funny that the only buddy I have in the world is a blob? But if you'd seen some of the guys I've been married to, boy, I wouldn't insult you by calling them blobs. Have to go now. See you tomorrow night, if they keep us both on. Now there was a problem to face. It was necessary that I establish control over my environment, at once. How else could I aspire to Margaret? I knew that the heart of the entire place here was neither the bar, nor the entertainment therein, nor the cuisine, nor the dancing. The heart of the enterprise was the casino. Here was the money that mattered. The rest was but garnish. I had them bring me to the gambling rooms. I had expected problems of complexity here, with which the patrons worked for their gain or loss. Instead, there was almost an amazing simplicity. All the games were based on first aspect numbers only. Indeed, everything on the planet Florida seemed to be based on first aspect numbers. Now, it is an elemental fact that first aspect numbers do not carry within them their own prediction, nor were the people even possessed of the prediction key that lies over the very threshold of the second aspect series. These people were actually wagering sums, the symbols of prosperity, blindly, not knowing for sure if they would win or lose. They were selecting numbers by hunch, or at random, with no assurance of profit. They were choosing a hole for the ball to fall into, without knowing whether that was the right hole. I do not believe that I was ever so amazed at anything in my life. But here was my opportunity to establish control over my environment. I began to play the games. Usually I would watch around first, to be sure that I understood just what was going on. Then I would play a few times, as many as it took to break the game. I broke game after game. When he could no longer pay me, Blackjack closed the casino in exasperation. Then we played poker, he and I, and several others. This was even more simple. I suddenly realized that the grub people could see only one side of the cards at a time. I played, and I won. I owned the casino now, and all those people were working for me. Billy Wilkins also played with us, so in short order I also owned the reptile ranch. Before the evening was over, I owned a racetrack, a beach hotel, and a theater in a place named New York. I had begun to establish control over my environment. Later, now started the golden days. I increased my control and did what I could for my friends. I got a good doctor for my old friend and roommate, Pete the Python, and he began to receive treatments for his indigestion. I got a jazzy sports car for my friend Eustace, imported from somewhere called Italy. And I buried Margaret in mink, for she had a fix on the fur of that mysterious animal. She enjoyed draping it about her in the form of coats, capes, cloaks, mantles, and stoles, though the weather didn't really require it. I had now won several banks, a railroad, an airline, and a casino in somewhere named Havana. You're somebody now, said Margaret. You really ought to dress better. Or are you dressed? I never know. I don't know if part of that is clothes, or if all of it is you. But at least I've learned which is your head. I think we should be married in May. It's so common to be buried in June. Just imagine me being Mrs. George Albert Leroy Ellery McIntosh. You know, we have become quite an item. And do you know there are three biographies of you out? Burgeoning Blob? the blob from way out, and the hidden hand behind the blob. What does it portend? And the governor has invited us to dine tomorrow. I do wish you would learn to eat. If you weren't so nice, you'd be creepy. I always say there's nothing wrong with marrying a man or a blob with money. It shows foresight on the part of a girl. You know you will have to get a blood test. You had better get it tomorrow. You do have blood, don't you? I did, but not, of course, of the color and viscosity of hers. But I could give it that color and viscosity temporarily, and it would react negatively to all the tests. 
she mused they are all jealous of me they say they wouldn't marry a blob they mean they couldn't do you have to carry that tin ball with you all the time yes it is my communication sphere in it i record my thoughts i would be lost without it oh like a diary how quaint yes those were the golden days the grubs appeared to me in a new light for was not margaret also a grub yet she seemed not so unfinished as the rest though lacking a natural outer casing she had not the appearance of crawling out from under a rock she was quite an attractive girl and she cared for me what more could i wish i was affluent i was respected i was in control of my environment and i could aid my friends of whom i now had acquired an astonishing number moreover my old space ineptitude sickness had left me i never felt better in my life ah the golden days one after the other like a pleasant dream and soon i am to be married four there has been a sudden change as on the planet hecuba where full summer turns into dead of winter in minutes to the destruction of many travelers so it was here my world is threatened it is tottering all that i have built i will fight i will have the best lawyers on the planet i am not done yet but i am threatened later this may be the end the appeal court has given its decision a blob may not own property in florida a blob is not a person of course i am not a person i never pretended to be but i am a personage i will yet fight this thing later i have lost everything the last appeal is gone by definition i am an animal of indeterminate origin and my property is being completely stripped from me i made an eloquent appeal and it moved them greatly there were tears in their eyes but there was greed in the set of their mouths they have a vested interest in stripping me each will seize a little and i am left a pauper a vassal an animal a slave this is always the last doom of the maroon to be a despised alien at the mercy of a strange world yet it should not be hopeless i will have margaret since my contract with billy wilkins and black jack bracken long since bought up is no longer in effect margaret should be able to handle my affairs as a person i believe that i have great earning power yet and i can win as much as i wish by gambling we will treat this as only a technicality we shall acquire a new fortune i will re-establish control over my environment i will bring back the golden days a few of my old friends are still loyal to me margaret pete the python eustace later the world has caved in completely margaret has thrown me over i'm sorry blobby she said but it just won't work you're still nice but without money you're only a blob how can i marry a blob but we can earn more money i'm talented no your box office poison now you were a fad and fads die quickly but margaret i can win as much as i wish gambling not a chance blobby nobody will gamble with you any more you're through blob i will miss you though there will be a new blue note in my ballots when i sing for my supper after the mink coats are all gone bye now margaret do not leave me what of all our golden days together but all she said was bye now and she was gone forever i am desolate and my old space ineptitude has returned my recovery was an illusion i am so ill with awkwardness that i can no longer fly i must walk on the ground like one of the giant grubs a curse on this planet florida and all its sister orbs what a miserable world this is how could i have been tricked by a young gamma type of the walking grub let her crawl back under her ancestral rock with all the rest of her kind no no i do not mean that to me she will always remain a dream a broken dream i am no longer welcome at the casino 
they kicked me down the front stairs. I no longer have a home at the reptile ranch. Mr. George Albert, said Eustace, I just can't afford to be seen with you any more. I have my position to consider, with the sports car and all that. Pete the Python was curt. Well, big shot, I guess you aren't so big after all. And you were sure no friend of mine. When you had that doctor cure my indigestion, you left me with nothing but my bad conscience. I wish I could get my indigestion back. A curse on this world, I said. World, world, water, water, glub, glub, said the turtles in their tanks, my only friends. So I have gone back into the woods to die. I have located my ejection mortar, and when I know that death is finally on me, I will fire off my communication sphere and hope it will reach the galactic drift. Whoever finds it, friend, space traveler, you who are too impatient to remain on your own world, be you warned of this one. Here ingratitude is the rule, and cruelty the main sport. The unfinished grubs have come out from under their rocks, and they walk this world upside down with their heads in the air. Their friendship is fleeting. Their promises are like the wind. I am near my end. End of The Weirdest World by R. A. Lafferty This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Yillian Way by Keith Laumer This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman The Yillian Way by Keith Laumer The ceremonious protocols of the Yills was impressive, colorful, and in the long run, deadly. Jamie Retrief, Vice Counsel and Third Secretary in the Diplomatic Corps, followed the senior members of the terrestrial mission across the tarmac and into the gloom of the reception building. The gray-skinned Yill guide, who had met the arriving embassy at the foot of the ramp, hurried away. The counselor, two first secretaries, and the senior attachés gathered around the ambassador, their ornate uniforms bright in the vast dun-colored room. Ten minutes passed. Retrief strolled across to the nearest door and looked through the glass panel at the room beyond. Several dozen Yill lounged in deep couches, sipping lavender drinks from slender glass tubes. Black tunic servants moved about inconspicuously, offering trays. A party of brightly dressed Yill moved toward the entrance doors. One of the party, a tall male, made to step before another, who raised a hand languidly, fist clenched. The first Yill stepped back and placed his hands on the top of his head. Both Yill were smiling and chatting as they passed through the doors. Retrief turned away to rejoin the terrestrial delegation, waiting beside a mound of crates made of rough greenish wood stacked on the bare concrete floor. As Retrief came up, Ambassador Spradley glanced at his finger watch and spoke to the man beside him. Then, are you quite certain our arrival time was made clear? Second Secretary Magnan nodded emphatically. I stressed the point, Mr. Ambassador. I communicated with Mr. Tichai Chai just before the lighter broke orbit, and I specifically— I hope you didn't appear truculent, Mr. Magnan, the Ambassador said sharply. No, indeed, Ambassador. I merely— You're sure there's no VIP room here? The Ambassador glanced around the cavernous room. Curious that not even chairs have been provided. If you'd care to sit on one of these crates, certainly not. The Ambassador looked at his watch again and cleared his throat. I may as well make use of these few moments to outline our approach for the more junior members of the staff. It's vital that the entire mission work in harmony in the presentation of the image. We terrestrials are a kindly, peace-loving race. 
The ambassador smiled in a kindly, peace-loving way. We seek only a reasonable division of spheres of influence with the Yill. He spread his hands, looking reasonable. We are a people of high culture, ethical, and sincere. The smile was replaced abruptly by pursed lips. We'll start by asking for the entire Serenian system and settle for half. We'll establish a foothold on all the choicer worlds. And, with shrewd handling, in a century we'll be in a position to assert a wider claim. The ambassador glanced around. If there are no questions, Retrieve stepped forward. It's my understanding, Mr. Ambassador, that we hold the prior claim on the Serenian system. Did I understand Your Excellency to say that we're ready to concede half of it to the Yill without a struggle? Ambassador Spradley looked up at Retrief, blinking. The young man loomed over him. Beside him, Magnan cleared his throat in the silence. Vice Council Retrief merely means, I can interpret Mr. Retrief's remarks, the ambassador snapped. He assumed a fatherly expression. Young man, you're new to the service. You haven't yet learned the team play, the give and take of diplomacy. I shall expect you to observe closely the work of the experienced negotiators of the mission. You must learn the importance of subtlety. Mr. Ambassador, Magnan said, I think the reception committee is arriving. He pointed. Half a dozen tall, short-necked yill were entering through a side door. The leading yill hesitated as another stepped in his path. He raised a fist, and the other moved aside, touching the top of his head perfunctorily with both hands. The group started across the room toward the terrestrials. Retrief watched as a slender alien came forward and spoke passable Terran in a reedy voice. I am Patal. Come this way. He turned, and the group moved toward the door, the ambassador leading. As he reached for the door, the interpreter darted ahead and shouldered him aside. The other yill stopped, waiting. The ambassador almost glared, then remembered the image. He smiled and beckoned the yill ahead. They milled uncertainly, muttering in the native tongue, then passed through the door. The Terran party followed. Give a great deal to know what they're saying. Retrief overheard as he came up. Our interpreter has forged to the van, the ambassador said. I can only assume he'll appear when needed. A pity we have to rely on a native interpreter, someone said. Had I known we'd meet this rather uncouth reception, the ambassador said stiffly, I would have audited the language personally, of course, during the voyage out. Oh, no criticism intended, of course, Mr. Ambassador. Heavens, Magnan put in. Who would have thought? Retrief moved up behind the ambassador. Mr. Ambassador, he said, I... Later, young man, the ambassador snapped. He beckoned to the first counselor, and the two moved off, heads together. Outside, a bluish sun gleamed in the dark sky. Retrief watched his breath form a frosty cloud in the chill air. A broad, donut-wheeled vehicle was drawn up to the platform. The Yill gestured the Terran party to the gaping door in the rear, then stood back, waiting. Retrief looked curiously at the gray-painted van. The legend written on the side in alien symbols seemed to read, Eggnog. The ambassador entered the vehicle, the other terrestrials following. It was as bare of seats as the terminal building. What appeared to be a defunct electronic chassis lay in the center of the floor. Retrief glanced back. The Yill were talking excitedly. None of them entered the car. The door was closed, and the Terrans braced themselves under the low roof as the engine started up with a whine of worn turbos. The van moved off. It was an uncomfortable ride. Retrief put out an arm as the vehicle rounded a corner, just catching the ambassador as he staggered, off balance. The ambassador glared at him settled his heavy tricornered hat, and stood stiffly until the car lurched again. Retrief stooped, attempting to see out through the single dusty window. They seemed to be in a wide street, lined with low buildings. They passed through a massive gate, 
up a ramp and stopped. The door opened. Retrief looked out at a blank gray facade, broken by tiny windows at irregular intervals. A scarlet vehicle was drawn up ahead. The Yale Reception Committee emerged from it. Through its wide windows, Retrief saw rich upholstery and caught a glimpse of glasses clamped to a tiny bar. Patoy, the ill interpreter, came forward, gesturing to a small door. Magnan opened it, waiting for the ambassador. As he stepped to it, the Yill thrust himself ahead and hesitated. Ambassador Spradley drew himself up, glaring. Then he twisted his mouth into a frozen smile and stepped inside. The Yill looked at each other, then filed through the door. Retrief was the last to enter. As he stepped inside, a black-clad servant slipped past him, pulled the lid from a large box by the door, and dropped a paper tray heaped with refuse. There were alien symbols in the flake paint on the box. They seemed, Retrief noted, to spell eggnog. 2. The shrill pipes and whining reeds had been warming up for an hour when Retrief emerged from his cubicle and descended the stairs to the banquet hall. Standing by the open doors, he lit a slender cigar and watched through narrowed eyes as the obsequious servants in black flitted along the low, wide corridor, carrying laden trays into the boardroom, arranging settings on the great four-sided table forming a hollow square that almost filled the room. Rich brocades were spread across the center of the side nearest the door, flanked by heavily decorated white cloths. Beyond, plain white extended to the far side, where metal dishes were arranged on the bare tabletop. A richly dressed Yill approached, stepped aside to allow a servant to pass, and entered the room. Retrief turned at the sound of Terran voices behind him. The ambassador came up, trailed by two diplomats. He glanced at Retrief, adjusted his ruff, and looked into the banquet hall. Apparently we're to be kept waiting again, he muttered. After having been informed at the onset that the Yill had no intention of yielding an inch, one almost wonders. Mr. Ambassador, Retrief said, have you noticed? However, Ambassador Spradley said, eyeing Retrief, a seasoned diplomat must take these little snubs in stride. In the end, ah, there, Magnan. He turned away, talking. Somewhere, a gong clanged. In a moment, the corridor was filled with chattering Yill, who moved past the group of terrestrials into the banquet hall. Patoy, the Yill interpreter, came up and raised a hand. Wait here. More Yill filed into the dining room to take their places. A pair of helmeted guards approached, waving the terrestrials back. An immense gray-jowled yill waddled to the door and passed through, followed by more guards. The chief of state, Retreat heard Magnan say, the admirable Faka Ka Ka. I have yet to present my credentials, Ambassador Spradley said. One expects some latitude in the observance of protocol, but I confess, he wagged his head. The yill interpreter spoke up. You now will lie on your intestines and creep to festive board there, he pointed across the room. Intestines? Ambassador Spradley looked about wildly. Mr. Patoy means our stomachs, I wouldn't wonder, Magnan said. He just wants us to lie down and crawl to our seats, Mr. Ambassador. What the devil are you grinning at, you idiot? the ambassador stamped. Magnan's face fell. Spradley glanced down at the medals across his paunch. This is, I've never. Homage to the goddess, the interpreter said. Oh, oh, religion, someone said. Well, if it's a matter of religious beliefs, the ambassador looked dubiously around. Golly, it's only a couple of hundred feet, Magnan offered. Retrief stepped up to Patoy. His Excellency, the terrestrial ambassador, will not crawl, he said clearly. Here, young man, I said nothing. Not to crawl, the interpreter wore an unreadable yill expression. It's against our religion, Retrief said. Against? We are votives of the snake goddess, Retrief said. 
It is a sacrilege to crawl. He brushed past the interpreter and marched toward the distant table. The others followed. Puffing, the ambassador came to Retrieve's side as they approached a dozen empty stools on the far side of the square opposite the brocade position of the admirable Faka Ka Ka. Mr. Retrieve, kindly see me after this affair, he hissed. In the meantime, I hope you will restrain from further rash impulses. Let me remind you I am the chief of mission here. Magnan came up from behind. Let me add my congratulations, Retrief, he said. That was fast thinking. Are you out of your mind, Magnan? the ambassador barked. I am extremely displeased. Why, Magnan stuttered, I was speaking sarcastically, of course, Mr. Ambassador. Didn't you notice the kind of shocked little gasp I gave when he did it? The terrestrials took their places, retrief at the end. The table before them was of bare green wood, with an array of shallow pewter dishes. Some of the yill at the table were in plain gray, others in black. All eyed them silently. There was a constant stir among them, as one or another rose and disappeared, and others sat down. The pipes and reeds were shrilling furiously, and the susurration of Yillian conversation from the other tables rose ever higher in competition. A tall Yill in black was at the ambassador's side now. The nearby Yill fell silent as he began ladling a whitish soup into the largest of the bowls before the terrestrial envoy. The interpreter hovered, watching. That's quite enough, Ambassador Spradley said, as the bowl overflowed. The Yill servant rolled his eyes, dribbled more of the soup into the bowl. Kindly serve the other members of my staff, the ambassador said. The interpreter said something in a low voice. The servant moved hesitantly to the next stool and ladled more soup. Retrief watched, listening to the whispers around him. The Yill at the table were craning now to watch. The soup ladler was ladling rapidly, rolling his eyes sideways. He came to Retrief, reached out with a full ladle for the bowl. No, said Retrief. The ladler hesitated. None for me, Retrief said. The interpreter came up and motioned to the servant, who reached again, ladle brimming. I don't like it, Retrief said, his voice distinct in the sudden hush. He stared at the interpreter, who stared back, then waved the servant away. Mr. Retrief, a voice hissed. Retrief looked down the table. The ambassador was leaning forward, glaring at him, his face a mottled crimson. I'm warning you, Mr. Retrief, he said hoarsely. I've eaten sheep's eyes in the Sudan, Ka Swa in Burma, hundred-year chug on Mars, and everything else that's been placed before me in the course of my diplomatic career. And by the holy relics of St. Ignatz, you'll do the same. He snatched up a spoon-like utensil and dipped it into his bowl. Don't eat that, Mr. Ambassador, Retrief said. The ambassador stared wide-eyed. He opened his mouth, guiding the spoon toward it. Retrief stood, gripped the table under its edge, and heaved. The immense wooden slab rose and tilted, dishes sliding. It crashed to the floor with a ponderous slam. Whitish soup spattered across the terrazzo. A couple of odd bowls rolled across the room. Cries rang out from the yill, mingled with a strangled yell from Ambassador Spradley. Retrief walked past the wide-eyed members of the mission to the sputtering chief. Mr. Ambassador, he said, I'd like, you'd like, I'll break you, you young hoodlum. Do you realize? Please, the interpreter stood at Retrief's side. My apologies, Ambassador Spradley said, mopping his forehead. My profound apologies. Be quiet, Retrief said. What? What? Don't apologize, Retrief said. Patoy was beckoning. Please, I'll come. Retrief turned and followed him. The portion of table they were ushered to was covered with an embroidered white cloth, set with thin porcelain dishes. The yill already seated there rose, amid babbling, and moved down the table. The black-clad yell at the end table closed ranks to fill the vacant seats. 
Retrieve sat down and found Magnan at his side. What's going on here? The second secretary said angrily. They were giving us dog food, Retrieve said. I overheard a yell. They seated us at the bottom of the servants' table. You mean you know their language? I learned it on the way out. Enough, at least. The music burst out with a clangorous fanfare, and a throng of jugglers, dancers, and acrobats poured into the center of the hollow square, frantically juggling, dancing, and backflipping. Black-clad servants swarmed suddenly, heaping mounds of fragrant food onto the plates of Yil and terrestrials alike, pouring a pale purple liqueur into slender glasses. Retrieve sampled the Yil food. It was delicious. Conversation was impossible in the din. He watched the gaudy display and ate heartily. 3. Retrieve leaned back, grateful for the lull in the music. The last of the dishes were whisked away, and more glasses filled. The exhausted entertainer stopped to pick up the thick square coins the diners threw. Retrief sighed. It had been a rare feast. Retrief, Magnan said in the comparative quiet, what were you saying about dog food as the music came up? Retrief looked at him. Haven't you noticed the pattern, Mr. Magnan? A series of deliberate affronts. Deliberate affronts? Just a minute, Retrief. They're uncouth, yes, crowding into doorways and that sort of thing. He looked at Retrief uncertainly. They herded us into a baggage warehouse at the terminal. Then they hauled us here in a garbage truck. Garbage truck? Only symbolic, of course. They ushered us in the tradesman's entrance and assigned us cubicles in the servant's wing. Then we were seated with the coolie class sweepers at the bottom of the table. You must be... I mean, we're the terrestrial delegation. Surely these Yill must realize our power. Precisely, Mr. Magnan, but... With a clang of cymbals, the musicians launched a renewed assault. Six tall, helmeted Yill sprang into the center of the floor and paired off in a wild performance, half dance, half combat. Magnan pulled at Retrieve's arm, his mouth moving. Retrieve shook his head. No one could talk against the Yale Orchestra in full cry. He sampled a bright red wine and watched the show. There was a flurry of action, and two of the dancers stumbled and collapsed, their partner opponents whirling away to pair off again, describe the elaborate pre-combat ritual, and abruptly set to, dull sabers clashing. And two more Yale were down, stunned. It was a violent dance. Retrief watched the drink forgotten. The last two Yill approached and retreated, whirled, bobbed, and spun, feigned and postured, and on the instant clashed, straining chest to chest, then broke apart, heavy weapons chopping, parrying, as the music mounted to a frenzy. Evenly matched the two hacked, thrust, blow for blow, across the floor, then back, defense forgotten, slugging it out, and then one was slipping, going down, helmet awry. The other, a giant muscular yill, spun away, whirled in a mad scurl of pipes as coins showered, then froze before a gaudy table, raised the saber, and slammed it down with a resounding blow across the gay cloth before a lace and bow bedecked yill, in the same instant that the music stopped. In utter silence, the dancer fighters stared across the table at the seated yill. With a shout, the Yill leapt up, raised a clenched fist. The dancer bowed his head and spread his hands on his helmet. Retrief took a deep gulp of the pale yellow liqueur and leaned forward to watch. The beribboned Yill waved a hand negligently, spilled a handful of coins across the table, and sat down. The challenger spun away in a screeching shrill of music. Retrief caught his eye for an instant as he passed. Then the dancer stood rigid before the brocade table, and the music stopped off short as the saber slammed down before a heavy yill in ornate metal coils. The challenged yill rose and raised a fist. The other ducked his head, put his hands on his helmet. The coins rolled. The dancer moved on. Twice more the dancer struck the table in ritualistic challenge, exchanged gestures, bent his neck, and passed on. He circled the broad floor, Saber twirling, arms darting in an intricate symbolism. The orchestra blared shrilly, 
unmuffled now by the surf roar of conversation. The yill, Retrief noticed suddenly, were sitting silent, watching. The dancer was closer now, and then he was before Retrief, poised, towering, saber above his head. The music cut, and in the startling instantaneous silence, the heavy saber whipped over and down with an explosive concussion that set the dishes dancing on the tabletop. The yill's eyes held on Retrief's. In the silence, Magnan tittered drunkenly. Retrief pushed back his stool. Steady, my boy, Ambassador Spradling called. Retrief stood. The yill topped his six foot three by an inch. In a motion almost too quick to follow, Retrief reached for the saber, twitched it from the yill's grip, swung it in a whistling cut. The yill ducked, sprang back, snatched up a saber dropped by another dancer. Someone stop that madman, Spradley howled. Retrief leapt across the table, sending fragile dishes spinning. The other danced back, and only then did the orchestra spring to life with a screech and a mad tattoo of high-pitched drums. Making no attempt to follow the weaving pattern of the yill bolero, Retrief pressed the other, fending off vicious cuts with the blunt weapon, chopping back relentlessly. Left hand on hip, Retrief matched blow for blow, driving the other back. Abruptly, the yill abandoned the double roll. Dancing forgotten, he settled down in earnest, cutting, thrusting, parrying. And now the two stood toe-to-toe, -to -toe, sabers clashing in a lightning exchange. The yill gave a step, two, then rallied, drove Retrief back, back. And the yill stumbled, his saber clattered, and Retrief dropped his point as the other wavered past him and crashed to the floor. The orchestra fell silent in a descending wail of reeds. Retrief drew a deep breath and wiped his forehead. "'Come back here, you young fools,' Bradley called hoarsely. Retrief hefted the saber, turned, eyed the brocade-draped table. He started across the floor. The gill sat as if paralyzed. "'Retrief, no!' Bradley yelled. Retrief walked directly to the admirable Faka ka ka stopped raised the saber not the chief of staff someone in the terrestrial mission groaned retrief whipped the saber down the dull blade split the cloth and clove the hardwood table there was utter silence the admirable faka ka ka rose seven feet of obese gray yill broad face expressionless to any terran eye he raised a fist like a jewel-studded ham retrief stood rigid for a long moment then, gracefully, he inclined his head, placed his fingertips on his temples. Behind him there was a clatter as Ambassador Spradley collapsed. Then the admirable Faka Ka Ka cried out and reached across the table to embrace the terrestrial, and the orchestra went mad. Gray hands helped retrieve across the table. Stools were pushed aside to make room at Faka Ka Ka's side. Retrief sat took a long flagon of coal-black brandy pressed on him by his neighbor, clashed the glass with the admirable, and drank. 4. Retrief turned at the touch on his shoulder. "'The ambassador wants to speak to you, Retrief,' Magnan said. Retrief looked across to where Ambassador Spradley sat glowering behind the plain tablecloth. "'Under the circumstances,' Retrief said, You'd better ask him to come over here. The ambassador? Magnan's voice cracked. Never mind the protocol, Retrief said. The situation is still delicate. Magnan went away. The feast ends, Fakao Kao Kao said. Now you and I, Retrief, must straddle the council stool. I'll be honored, Admirable, Retrief said. I must inform my colleagues. Colleagues, Fakao Kao Kao said. It is for chiefs to parley. Who shall speak for a king while he yet has a tongue for talk? The Yilway is wise, Retrief said. The cow 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 emptied a squat tumbler of pink beer. I will treat with you, Retrief, as viceroy, since, as you say, your king is old and the space between worlds is far. But there shall be no scheming underlings privy to our dealings. He grinned a Yil grin. Afterwards we shall carouse, Retrief. The council stool is hard, and the waiting handmaidens delectable. 
This makes for quick agreement. Retrieve smiled. The king is wise. Of course, a being prefers wenches of his own kind, the cow 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 said. He belched. The Minister of Culture has imported several terry, excuse me, Retrief, terrestrial joy girls, said to be top notch specimens. At least they have very fat, whatchamacallit. The king is most considerate, Retrief said. Let us to it then, Retrief. I may hazard a fling with one of your terries myself. I fancy an occasional perversion. The cow 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 dug an elbow into Retrief's side and bellowed with laughter. Ambassador Spradley hurried to intercept Retrief as he crossed to the door at the cow cow cow's side. Retrief, kindly excuse yourself. I wish a word with you. His voice was icy. Magnan stood behind him, goggling. Mr. Ambassador, forgive my apparent rudeness, Retrief said. I don't have time to explain now. Rudeness, Spradley barked. Don't have time, eh? Let me tell you. Lower your voice, Mr. Ambassador, Retrieve said. Scradley quivered, mouth open, speechless. If you'll sit down and wait quietly, Retrieve said, I think. You think, Spradley spluttered. Silence, Retrieve said. Spradley looked up at Retrieve's face. He stared for a moment into Retrieve's gray eyes, closed his mouth, and swallowed. The Yill seem to have gotten the impression I'm in charge, Retrief said. We'll have to keep it up. But, but, Spradley stuttered. Then he straightened. This is the last straw, he whispered hoarsely. I am the terrestrial ambassador extraordinary and minister plentemporary. Magnan has told me that we have been studiedly insulted, repeatedly, since the moment of our arrival, kept waiting in the baggage rooms, transported in refuge lorries, herded about with servants, offered swill at table. Now I and my senior staff are left cooling our heels, without even so much as an audience, while this, this multiple cow person hobnobs with, with, Spradley's voice broke. I may have been a trifle hasty retrief in attempting to restrain you. Blaspheming the native gods and dumping the banquet table are rather extreme measures, but your resentment was perhaps partially justified. I am prepared to be lenient with you. He fixed a choleric eye on Retrief. I am walking out of this meeting, Mr. Retrief. I'll have no more of these deliberate personal... That's enough, Retrief snapped. You're keeping the king waiting. Get back to your chair and sit there until I come back. Magnan found his voice. What are you going to do, Retrief? I'm going to handle the negotiation, Retrief said. He handed Magnan his empty glass. Now go sit down and work on the image. At his desk, in the VIP suite aboard the orbiting core vessel, Ambassador Spradley pursed his lips and looked severely at Vice Consul Retrief. Further, he said, you have displayed a complete lack of understanding of core discipline, the respect due a senior agent. Even the basic courtesies, your aggravated displays of temper, Ill-timed outbursts of violence and almost incredible arrogance in the assumption of authority make your further retention as an officer agent of the diplomatic corps impossible. It will therefore be my unhappy duty to recommend your immediate... There was a muted buzz from the communicator. The ambassador cleared his throat. Well? A signal from the Sector HQ, Mr. Ambassador, a voice said. Well? Read it, Spradley snapped. Skip the preliminaries. Congratulations on the unprecedented success of your mission. The Articles of Agreement transmitted by you embody the most favorable resolution of a difficult Serenian situation, and will form the basis of continued amicable relations between the terrestrial states and the Yale Empire. To you and your staff, full credit is due for a job well done. Signed, Deputy Assistant Secretary. Spradley cut off the voice impatiently. He shuffled papers eyed Retrief sharply. Superficially, of course, an uninitiated observer might leap to the conclusion that the, um, results that were produced, in spite of these, um, irregularities, justify the latter. The ambassador smiled a sad, wise smile. This is far from the case, he said. I... The communicator burped softly. 
Confound it, Spradley muttered. Yes? Mr. Takaka has arrived, the voice said. Shall I? Send him in at once. Spradley glanced at Retrief. Only a two-syllable man, but I shall attempt to correct these false impressions. Make some amends. The two terrestrials waited silently until the Yale Protocol chief tapped at the door. I hope, the ambassador said, that you will resist the impulse to take advantage of your unusual position. He looked at the door. Come in. Takai Kai stepped into the room, glanced at Spradley, turned to greet Retrief in voluble yell. He rounded the desk to the ambassador's chair, motioned him from it, and sat down. I have a surprise for you, Retrief, he said, in Terran. I myself have made use of the teaching machine you so kindly lent us. That's fine, to Kai Kai, Retrief said. I'm sure Mr. Spradley will be interested in hearing what we have to say. Never mind, the eel said. I am here only socially. He looked around the room. So plainly you decorate your chamber, but it has certain austere charm. He laughed a yell laugh. Oh, you are a strange breed, you terrestrials. You surprised us all. You know, one hears such outlandish stories. I tell you in confidence, we had expected you to be overpushes. Pushovers, Spradley said tonelessly. Such restraint. What pleasure you gave to those of us like myself, of course, who appreciated your grasp of protocol. Such finesse. How subtly you appeared to ignore every overture while neatly avoiding actual contamination. I can tell you, there were those who thought, poor fools, that you had no grasp of etiquette. How gratified we were, we professionals, who would appreciate your virtuosity, when you placed matters on a comfortable basis by spurning the cat's meal. It was sheer pleasure, then, waiting to see what form your compliment would take. The Yill offered orange cigars, stuffed one in his nostril. I confess that I had not hoped that you would honor our admirable so signally. Oh, it is a pleasure to deal with fellow professionals who understand the meaning of protocol. Ambassador Spradley made a choking sound. This fellow has caught a chill, Takai Kai said. He eyed Spradley dubiously. Step back, my man. I am highly susceptible. There is one bit of business I shall take pleasure in attending to, my dear Retrief. The Kai Kai went on. He drew a large paper out of his reticule. The admirable has determined that none other than yourself shall be accredited here. I have here my government's executor confirming you as the terrestrial council general to Yill. We shall look forward to your prompt return. Retrief looked at Spradley. I'm sure the corps will agree, he said. Then I shall be going, the Kai Kai said. He stood up. Hurry back to us, Retrief. There is much I would like to show you of Yill. I'll hurry back, Retrief said, and, with a Yill wink, together we shall see many high and splendid things. End of the Yillian Way by Keith Laumer This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org